she checked off the things she needed to do. She introduced herself, told her backstory, uh, did a bunch of policy stuff, checked those boxes. But the thing that was incredible and puts her in the Hall of Fame category with 80 and 60 is that she trolled him like I've never seen before, like, like nobody's ever done. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. I'm pumped to be back with my partner in crime, Mark McKinnon. He's a media advisor for both Democratic and Republican campaigns, including W, McCain, and Richards. Uh, and he's co-creator, executive producer of a little show called The Circus you might have heard of. Uh, hey, MCAT, what's going on, man? Hello, Thelma. Louise here. Good to see you again, my old pal. Yeah, long time no see. The last two months. It's just a crime that we weren't able to be out oh there. Oh, <laughs> my God. I mean, it's just insane. It's it's just ridiculous that we're not on the air right now. Uh, I mean, this is more circusy than anything we ever covered and and would be epic. But we can talk about it. Unbelievable. I did I did my best without the cameras to do circus type behavior in the spin room um, uh, the, the other night. You know, and, we uh, can always count on you. Um, well, let, let's I want to talk about the debate. I, I buzzed you. Um, I had to, we had a little hurricane in New Orleans. So my schedule got uh, got, you know, uh, mixed around and I, I needed a I needed a pinch header. So thank you for pinch hitting. Uh, but I, I, I text you right after I saw this tweet. Bob Shrum, a former Democratic strategist, had sent this. He, he wrote, I coached a lot of presidential and other candidate debates. Harris had one of the very best debates ever, JFK 60, Reagan 80 level. Uh, you replied, as have I, and worked against Bob, and I 100% agree. Really? That good? Reagan 80 uh, for you? Y- yeah, really that good. Um, for, for a bunch of reasons, um, the... You know, I, I, the, the, first of all, Bob Shrum is one of the best uh, in the business ever. And I, you know, uh, watched him and also worked against him. He was a big Kennedy guy and and prep for Gore. Uh, so he's a Hall of Famer and doesn't say that casually. But uh, you think about the stakes that were at play here. And the thing is that, you know, the, the, the what's important to remember here is that people are not just I mean, people are natural born communicators. People are not natural born presidential debaters. It takes a goddamn lot of work and a lot of preparation if you're actually going to excel at this. And, you know, you can try and wing it like Trump did and see what happened. But also George W. Bush winged it in his reelect. Obama winged it in his reelect. They didn't take it seriously. And they got their asses handed to him. Uh, And it's a very particular kind of preparation that it takes. Uh, I mean, you have to understand what a split screen means. and, And she did that exceptionally well i mean she in that debate she looked like she was you know on the beach in the uh, in the sun uh, trump looked like he was in a hailstorm freezing his ass he looked miserable i mean she she had this a debate there was so much at stake mostly for her you know trump was not going to move the dial one way or the other much people have fixed opinions but a lot of people don't know her they're they were kind of open to uh, whether or not they might consider her and you, listen, I mean, there's sort of just the sound test. Turn the sound off. What did it look like? She looked relaxed, in control, calm, presidential. Uh, you know, for people who just turned in, they say, yeah, yeah I, could, I could see her in the Oval. Uh, and so uh, the, you know, she, she, she checked off the things she needed to do. She introduced herself, told her backstory, uh, did a bunch of policy stuff, checked those boxes. But the thing that was incredible and puts her in the Hall of Fame category with 80 and 60 is that she trolled him like I've never seen before, like like nobody's ever done. And not only trolled him, but here's an interesting aspect of the trolling. She not only trolled him and just went right to his deepest psyche, which is so smart. You think about the debate prep and they go, where, what's the thing he's most proud of? Like, you know, Wharton School, uh, crowd size. And just go right at what he thinks his strengths are, and that'll take him off the chain. And it fucking did. Uh, but she also did it. The times that she trolled, if you go back and look at it, she did it when she was being sort of attacked on her weak points. Yes. Like when she got pinned on immigration, she counterpunched on the trolling. So she took it right off her weak spot and went right to his, which was incredible. I was talking with somebody on our team about that. And actually, they had a planned, because I also called it a crowd size joke yesterday, but it wasn't really. It was, it was even deeper than that. It was like, you're a bad entertainer joke. It's like people leave early. They get bored. Like people are walking out of, on you. Like people are ready to turn the page, which is even kind of a deeper cut. But they had like planned 
that around something later in the debate where she was going to do it and like the immigration question comes up and she gives her answer and then she's just like you know i'm just gonna throw the i'm gonna throw yeah. the you're boring people thing on the end of this to, yeah. to kind of get you to change the subject I, that was not the plan according to the yeah. team it yeah, was like well, done on the fly by her really well done and that that shows incredible uh, ability and performance uh that, that's just just not a natural thing and you know people say well, you know, it's it's a debate, and what does that have to do with being president? Presidents, you know, thrown into a situation where a camera's on, so they have thirty seconds to answer a question. That's true, but what presidents do have to do is prepare, prepare for foreign yes. leaders' meetings, prepare for crises, and this showed that she has the discipline to prepare and 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 be and, you know and act like a president, which is and and to be. I mean, think how much was on her shoulder. I mean, talk about tension city, as she looks so fucking relaxed. Uh, and then one other thing I just want to do a shout out. Yeah. This is such inside baseball stuff, Tim, but, but, but it's important to give a shout out. You know, I was around the edges of a lot of prep, but I was a shallow media guy. There was always somebody in the room who was actually really organized, really right. like going through the list, had the, the, yeah, binder. had the binders. <laughs> yeah. And that's Karen Dunn, you know, and I've worked with her and she is talk about hall of fame. And then here's an interesting data point that I learned and I, I, I won't out where it came from, but it's a reliable source that she did all this at the same time. She's one of the most powerful lawyers at one of the most powerful law firms in the country. And they have, according to my source, they were opening a trial for one of the biggest firms in the country this same week. So she was doing both. So like Ann Richards backwards and in high heels. Unbelievable. Karen Dunn. Um, I, I, I grabbed uh, for, for Vanity Fair. You wrote piece of advice for Harris going into the debate. I just thought it'd be fun to, to go back through those. Uh, you, you gave 10 pieces of advice, but here were your top eight. One, confidence is key. Check. Two, tomorrow is better than yesterday. Check. Three, you can be both the incumbent and the change candidate. Yep. Four, pronouncements that separate from Biden are encouraged. She literally said, I'm not Joe Biden, and in kind of a funny way at one point. Five, drive, drive home freedom message. Six, bait Trump and switch. Seven, almost ignore him from time to time. I, I don't know if she hit that one. Eight, laugh. All of them. I mean, she did everything. Yeah, I, this, uh, what I said was uh, it takes extraordinary preparation. And, uh, you know, the, the politics is, is about performance, especially at this level. And uh, to, to do what she did requires extraordinary preparation. And she just was a pro. She's like a professional athlete, you know, and, and she just she prepared. She had the muscles right. She had the playbook down and she she went out and executed. Let's talk about that. I, I mean, so you interviewed her uh, for the circus. You've covered her. I, I don't I mean, look, during the during the troubles, as I like to call them, um, when, after the Biden debate, um, you know, the the whispered thing in dc from democrats I, I was always a little more bullish on her than kind of what people were saying to me privately but i was also concerned you know we'd seen her at times be in her head a little bit in some of these interviews i i mean did you see this coming like this level of of <laughs> hall of fame baseball whatever you call it I, did you see any of that when you were covering her spending time or have you been surprised as well well listen i think she exceeded everybody's expectations nobody expected that level of performance you know for something that was so critical um but but what i what i i did think that she you know her stock was undervalued and i i interviewed her for the circus and i i always felt that she had that she was a natural that she knew that not only a natural but that she was a performer uh that she yeah. could when the light lights go on she she hits a switch and like ann richards or others she just she could she could turn it on at, at, at with a flick of a switch and um, there was also just kind of a natural, she was just relaxed. And, and I, there was sort of, sort of that, you know, it was fun being around her. She just, she was sort of playful and she had to laugh and yeah. uh, it just kind of an ease about her. She wasn't uptight, you know, she wasn't like, oh God, I'm in an interview. And what should I say? You know, and so uh, I, I always, I, you know, I thought that, uh, you know, vice president sees McCain always said, you know, you get kept in the dark and get fed scraps. So, there's always a bit of that that, you know, I think is unfair. And I think there was a bit of misogyny always going on as well, too. But but that she worked that to her advantage. You know, every, she, everybody underestimated her. And the best thing in the world to go into a debate is to be underestimated and overperform, yeah. which is exactly what she did. You know, those podcast ads that sound like a robot reading a script. Well, here's me, the robot reading for the perfect gene, including this bit. They sent me their genes. And after wearing them to battle, against my child playing as Yoshi in Mario Kart, 
I can confidently say they're even better than advertised. But is that my true opinion or just more of the script? Only one way to find out. I got to tell you, these jeans fit like they were custom made. Stretch like you wouldn't believe and look fantastic. The fabric is soft as a baby's bottom. No babies involved. Promise. The perfect jean. Say goodbye to stiff cardboard denim and say hello to cute comfort. The perfect jean has a seriously massive range of sizes with six fits from skinny, which you know I like, to thick, thick waist sizes from 26 to 50 and lengths from 26 to 38. So it doesn't matter if you're a short king or a thick zaddy or something in between. You can find the perfect fit for the body you're rocking. For a limited time, our listeners get 15% off their first order plus free shipping at theperfectgene.nyc or Google The Perfect Gene and use code BULWARK15 for 15% off. We've been talking, you know, we've been doing this Perfect Gene ad for a while. You guys know, you guys know how important my genes are to my identity, that skinny gene, remembering my first gay skinny gene. And But here's the thing, I like... You know, I now these days I'm on planes a lot. You know, I've been I was flying up to Philly for the debate. I was on that train down to D.C. yesterday. I had to go to a hipster indie rock show at the Atlantis. I, I need something that is, that looks good and is skinny, but also you know is comfortable. Something that I can work with when I'm on that shaky Acela, sitting across from Tim Murtaugh. And I got to tell you, the perfect jeans been the perfect answer for that. And the perfect jean doesn't stop there. They've revolutionized t-shirts as well. The perfect tee has just enough stretch to hide that beer belly. Not a problem for me. While accentuating your arms and chest. Also not a problem for me. For that flawless look. It's soft as butter without shrinking in the wash like all your other tees. It's just perfect. The perfect jean has free shipping, exchanges, and returns. You can have peace of mind knowing that your order is completely risk-free. It's finally time to stop wearing uncomfortable jeans by going to theperfectgene.nyc. Our listeners get 15% off your first order plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges when you use code BULWARK15 at checkout. That's 15% off for new customers at theperfectgene.nyc with promo code BULWARK15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them, Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Fuck your khakis and get the perfect gene. Let's talk about the substance of it a little bit. The you know you've spent most of your career talking to the big middle folks. Um, she ran pretty far to the left in 2019 and has been trying hard to pivot to the middle. Like how do you how do you feel about the efficacy of that? You know of of that pivot and and you know the Republicans' efforts to kind of brand her as as on the far left. Pretty good. I mean, the one thing that I'd say about her and Trump, uh, and the one thing she shares with Trump, I, I don't think at her core she's ideological. I think she's practical. Yeah. You know, I think she's kind of navigated the water. She came up to California. She kind of did what she had to do. But but she's never been pinned ideological, despite Bernie Sanders. Uh, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Bernie. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in 2019, it was wrong, but it was the practical conventional wisdom among Democrats that 100%. like, oh, this is the moment that's the progressive right. left, you know, is is ascendant and, you know, the racial justice like that yeah. was like the yeah. that was the well, conventional. And it was and it turned out to be wrong. It was Biden was the primary. But that's what the smart people thought. I think she was just do, she was acting practically. Exactly right. And the one thing that I'll say that I think is really important is that. I, and I know you know this, I learned a lot more from losing campaigns than winning campaigns. And I think she did too. Yeah. And the thing about her is if you've watched her over time, she's gotten better and better and better and better and better. She's grown and you can just see it. She's like, you know, she played in the minors. She, you know, she, she, you know, she got her batting practice down and now she's fucking, she's slamming them, man. It is because she's done this a lot. And 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 she's gotten really good at it. And and so p for people who turn on the television and look at it, they go, yeah, she, it looks like she knows what she's doing. She looks, she's presidential. And and by the way, I think it's a big strategic mistake for the Republicans and Trump to call her a flip flopper because that's basically saying, oh, she's moving to where most Americans are. Right. It'd be much better to just say she's still a fucking liberal because that's yeah. what people don't want. Yeah, and and I think that she maybe still has some work to do on that on the economic side of things. But I don't on the foreign policy stuff. Woo. To me, like <laughs> flying colors. Like when I a little briefing with her privately a couple earlier this year, and and that was the thing I took away from that was that like she has been doing the homework on foreign policy stuff and taking it very seriously, and she has had a familiarity with it, and and the themes that she was sounding are themes that I don't know 
2004 8 MCAT could have written for her and some of that's some of the stuff I mean she sound she was sounding very you know, you know in, in the bipartisan tradition of the country as far as that yeah concerned. and it also sounded you know like it wasn't talking points it felt like it was sort of coming from right. a core of experience and that you know that's the thing that you get from being a vice president you know a lot of you're behind the scenes a lot but you're absorbing a lot as well and by the way on that front you know uh, you know whatever you think of Joe Biden that's something he did exceptionally well yeah you um you mentioned that in you said in the airport you're in the airport uh, you do you know you're kind of like a uh, Thomas Friedman, Thomas Friedman in the cowboy hat, you know, kind of getting information <laughs> from regular people, uh, and said he met some Ukrainian folks. And she was so strong in Ukraine, strong. I liked how she tied it to Poland. Um, but oh, you so you, smart. Yeah. So yeah. Talk, about, talk about the substance of her kind of conversation on the Ukraine policy, and then the, the conversation you had in the airport. Well, I mean, he, this is something that I didn't even notice until I saw somebody remark on it later. But she. When she was talking about Ukraine, she talked about sort of a, you know, the the, the Polish component of that history yeah. and, and the conflict that relates to, I don't know what the number is, like 50,000 people who, Polish people who live in Pennsylvania, uh, that it's going to have a direct impact on and, and, and relevance to. And that's, boy, that's talk about a smart, you know, game playing, uh, you know, where, you know, the the David Pluff you know, <laughs> yeah. don't talk about the five thousand. Talk about the demographics. About the the demographics five, yeah. matter, they get us elected. Yeah. So that that was super smart. And then my 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 Friedman uh, uh, focus group was I just was in DCA airport and a woman walked up to me who's from Ukraine, and um, you know it was really sweet. But she said, you know, I just wanted to tell you that you know first of all, coming from Ukraine, I really love what Harris had to say. But more importantly, she said, I have a daughter who is uh, in college in, in Illinois. And she said that she's, she and her sorority sisters, none of whom had voted before, all watched the debate and every single one of them was now registered and voting for Kamala Harris. Yeah. That's a ridiculously you know, fine point anecdote, yeah. but I'm hearing more and more and more of that. And I think the thing that's maybe overlooked in this election and undervalued at this point is we talk a lot about undecided voters I don't think there's a lot of those. There may be a lot of unregistered voters who are registering. And you think about the Taylor Swift impact and stuff like that. Those kind of things could make a difference. She's she's breaking some brains out there on the Internet. Uh, I, I have a little montage for you uh, from Dave, Dave Rubin, Russian stooge, a uh, big, big influencer, tons, <laughs> two, millions of followers on YouTube, apparently was taking Russian money unwittingly. And Megan Kelly, Rich Lowry talking about uh, talking about Taylor Swift. Let's listen to that. Uh, Elon Musk, who they hate. Uh, he saw that and he wrote this. Fine, Taylor, you win. I will give you a child and guard your cats with my life. So he's ex he's mocking, he's exposing the ridiculousness, right? It's like, Taylor Swift, you are a young, pretty girl. Do you know what the gang members from Venezuela do to young, pretty girls? It ain't pretty. I'm allowed to criticize Taylor Swift, and I don't give a shit who gets upset. This is disgusting. She, if she wants to vote Harris Walls, she can do it all she wants. But to say the reason she's doing it is because of Tim Walls' stance on LGBTQ, F you Taylor Swift. And Emily, this is unbelievable. The left is losing its mind. She signed it Taylor Swift, childless cat lady. Why you, I, the anger? <laughs> where's, where's all this anger come from? Ta Elon wants to father her children. Dave Rubin's <laughs> fantasizing her about her getting raped by Venezuelan migrants. Megan Kelly's F wording her. I, I, I mean, I, these, these people are, I've, I've, I've lost the plot a little bit. Yeah, Tim, there's a uh, there's a Cajun expression that uh, you'll hear from James Carville, hit dogs bark. Yeah. <laughs> Those dogs are hit, man. Yeah. You, I mean, it's ridiculous. Are you kidding? Megyn Kelly, she's saying fuck you because because some celebrity endorsed a candidate. My, come on. I mean, you didn't say that about Hulk Hogan, for God's sake. Uh, and, and I just think it, it testifies to it really hit a nerve. And, and, you know, you talk about the value of celebrity endorsements. Taylor Swift. Here's my idea for yeah. Taylor. Let's do it. Uh, uh, she she goes to the swing states, does concerts that are free for unregistered voters, and if you're unregistered, you get in free, and you have to register at the concert. Yeah. Oof. Okay. I don't know. Uh, get in for free? I don't know. They, that's she has a pretty fancy setup there, Mark. I don't know if oh, I, I don't know if we're, we're subsidizing that. I think she can afford tickets. it. 
I think she can afford it. All right. Well, I'm, I mean, I think there's no bad ideas in a brainstorm. We're gonna we're gonna start we're gonna start playing <laughs> with that. But I'm I'm with you. More more voter. Well, edge. she's already. I think re- just in her little uh, link that she put out, she's already registered almost a half a million new voters. Yeah, crazy. And and the co- you know you just think about the college um, dynamic, North Carolina. You know, and obviously the big state schools up in the Midwest. Um, there, there's a non. Uh, non-trivial amount of people that, that can get engaged for, for something like this. I, I, I do agree with that. I think that that's obviously the bigger impact than her convincing people. I, I, I want to go back to the foreign policy thing with Ukraine, though. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I, I'm asking everybody this. It's my obsession. So I've got to ask you, because you know this world. I, the folks that you worked with in W world that are on the NATSEC side of things, I, I, what more do these people want from her? You know, the Condies, the Bob Gates, the W himself. Like, why why haven't more of them spoken out on behalf of Kamala, do you think? Well, um, I, I think it's a remarkable number who have, and the, all those dominoes are falling, and it's like a new one every day, and there's 50 days left, and I'm still holding out hope my boss will come out. I mean, we know how he thinks. He knows what he thinks about the, oh, this weird shit. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and know how strongly they feel about, uh, you know, what's happened to uh, foreign policy and how, uh, you know, what Trump has done to the America first notion and standing up strong against Russia and all of that. So, you know, that Condi Rice is just gritting her teeth every day as a, you know, as a Russian expert of all Russian experts yeah. watching this. So, yes, I agree. And, and, uh, but like I said, you know, Alberto Gonzalez came out today or yesterday and it was like a new one every day. That's true. You're always more of the glass half full guy than me. This is, this is the Thelma and Louise balance. You know, I'm always like, I oh, want all of them. Like I'm every the last person. one until the last dog dies. I'm going to be shouting at the moon. Um, the, uh, I, I, this it is the foreign policy thing that is the most striking, right? Cause I, I just think that like, it would have been understandable if you're a national security conservative that doesn't like Trump that like doesn't really know what her foreign policy is going to be, right? Like you don't know who's going to be around her. You're a little worried. She's California liberal. Who knows, right? Um, uh, you know, you heard, you, you read something on Fox somewhere when you're still watching Brett Baer that is that her dad was a Marxist, right? Like you just, you got, you got some little concerns in your head. But since she's been out there, like the last seven weeks on foreign policy in particular, I mean, she has just been right down the middle. Like, like not missing a beat on any. Yeah, no equivocation, hard as a hammer, tough as steel. Uh, And it's like, again, it's not like talking quits. It's something that's coming from her core. And it doesn't feel like something she just sort of recently adopted. The the only substantive complaint I've heard from anyone on foreign policy is from the left on Israel stuff. You know, the left was hoping that I think that she was going to be was going to tamp down some of the. Or, or at least leave the door open, maybe more to some more distancing from Israel, and she ha- she hasn't done it. So yeah, yeah, and I think she's navigated that one pretty adroitly as well. Were you surprised by Dick Cheney? No, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised by Liz, of course, but yeah. Dick, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Cheneys are all in. Do you want to? Can you can you get your ad man hat on for me? Do can we do it? I've 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 been you had your Taylor Swift idea while we're brainstorming. I like Dick Cheney and AOC. And a joint, oh, sitting that's... in the living room like yeah. the one you're in right oh. now. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe a, a cultural, we disagree on, but... a cultural exchange. You know, he's <laughs> giving her some elk or some like some meat <laughs> from Wyoming, and it's, you know, she's yeah. cooking up some <laughs> some beans and rice or something for him. <laughs> you know, I don't know. They get him in the kitchen, a little cooking show. Oh, I can't do better than that. That's yeah, right. well, we're working yeah. on it. Y'all, I've just been a longtime reader of the Washington Post. I've told you about this before, but I just think back to my dorm, being a dorky freshman, coming to GW because I liked politics and getting so excited because they had that Washington Post for free sitting there in the lobby of Lafayette Hall. And uh, I've been reading it ever since. We've been having Washington Post uh, reporters on this podcast, and it continues to be a valuable resource for me. So that's why I'm so excited that this podcast is sponsored by the Washington Post. Right now, you go to WashingtonPost.com slash The Bulwark, and you can subscribe for just 50 cents per week for your first year. If you listen to this podcast, you know the great work the Washington Post does on topics from Capitol Hill to Carol Lenning doing Secret Service to uh, Isaac Arnsdorf doing politics. Uh, In fact, I was just reading Isaac's story this morning, um, which I really appreciated about Trump beginning to stoke suspicions, quote unquote, about the assassination attempt and how it's raising fears among people in law enforcement 
that uh, that it might end up stoking more violence. I, this is like one random aside of the debate, and you know it gets lost sometimes in the coverage when Trump does this kind of stuff. Uh, but our man Isaac was right on it, and he had a great story about it this morning. I was just reading right before I got on the podcast. Plus, if you're in a rush and need to catch up quickly on the day's most important and interesting stories, the Post the 7 newsletter is a quick commute read sent each weekday morning, and it's also available as a podcast. But don't listen to it before me. The Post has other cool features for audio lovers like you. Uh, You can actually listen to the articles now in addition to reading them. So you can tackle your to-do list. You can fold some clothes while you're catching up on the news at the same time. With the election rapidly approaching, now is the time to sign up for The Washington Post. Go to WashingtonPost.com slash The Bulwark to subscribe for just 50 cents per week for your first year. That's 80% off their typical offer. So this is truly a steal. Once again, that's WashingtonPost.com backslash The Bulwark to subscribe for just 50 cents per week for your first year. I want to talk, I want to, we want to pivot to the cat stuff. And uh, <laughs> I, I mean, these fucking guys, they're quadrupling down on the this totally made up racist conspiracy that Haitian immigrants are abducting animals and eating them. Um, Bill Haggerty was on CNN uh, the other day or yesterday saying that he, uh, you know, he's been hearing things on the internet, Senator from Tennessee, Chris Rufo, who's supposedly from the intellectual wing of MAGA, kind of that Ron DeSantis put him uh, in charge of a university down there. Uh, he put out a tweet offering a $5,000 bounty for anybody that can provide evidence of Haitian immigrants eating cats, I, like, what 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 is that? I, how did they get? Well, here? well, here here, well, Laura Loomer traveling around in the plane. That that's yeah. uh, that's part of it. Let's stop with that. Tell people who that is. Like, okay, Laura I'm, I'm Loomer is like the, the most outrageous sort of QAnon conspiracy theorist out there. So far out there that she's getting attacked by Marjorie Taylor Greene as being out of the mainstream. Yeah. Too uh, crazy from MTG. Yes, exactly. And um, it's kind of a delicious Twitter fight for the real oh, sickos out I there. It. You might want to yeah, go, to go and look at the MTG Laura Loomer Twitter fight. It's it's uh, a yeah, it's, it's kind of like it's, a the let them fight meme in a, in a big uh, way. A beautiful thing. So yeah, you we, you know Eric Erickson, who is mm-hmm. a you know f- you know well known uh, journalist on on the right, who's no Harris fan, and his tweet yesterday was you know. Okay, okay, you stupid motherfuckers. You know, you realize that by putting out this ridiculous shit, you just threw out the bait and made, you know, the guy who should be the next president look like a complete idiot. Yeah. And I responded to that to say, yeah, and you know who stupid motherfucker number one is? J.D. Vance. Yeah. Because he's the guy that was out there promoting it. And the thing the thing to me that's worse than or, or the, the, the worst thing about all of that is that when asked about it, they 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 double down and, and make it worse by saying and when people say what's your evidence they say well we heard it from a, a constituent so just like the the, the steal the boat stuff back in 20 well i don't have any evidence but people are telling me so therefore i'm reporting it and and you know so they're just they rather than being you know doing what elected leaders do is to find the facts and then tell your constituents they're letting their constituents just feed off conspiracy horse shit and then they're repeating it and amplifying it. <laughs> it's like, just think about the J.D. Vance pick also for a minute. Oh, I, God. I, 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 uh, I, I love that. I mean, just, you know, it is Trump's body language on Vance now is so good. It's a, then, I mean, how <laughs> how do you get in a situation if you are Susie Miles, our friend, uh, friendish, <laughs> and Chris yeah. Las Vida and Trump, and you're going down the list, and you're like, we are going to pick a VP that is actually it, it, uh, putting – even more conspiratorial <laughs> material into the campaign than Trump. It's like, it's like, how could you find a person? It's like Trump <laughs> is the conspiracy monger in chief. And like, uh, here, we, here we got one where we picked where our VP candidate is actually, uh, uh, instead of kind of reining him in or, you know, being the, being the, you know, bumpers on the bowling lane for him, trying to keep him in the middle, he's accelerating it. You know who's loving this? Sarah Palin. Oh my God. <laughs> you know? yeah. she's, no longer she's the worst not... pick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's incredible. You think, I mean, the first first job of a VP pick is to do no harm. And he's doing harm like every fucking day. Every day. I, they can't like each other. I, he can't li- like, does Trump you, well, hang you know, out with him? I mean, as I said, the body language of Trump is like every time he gets asked about J.D. Vance, it's like, I don't talk to J.D. Vance. That, you know, he doesn't share my, you know, it, everything yeah. is like clear, like he's, 
you know he's on the phone with Junior saying, what in the fuck? Why did you, why did you insist on this guy? Don Jr.'s in the doghouse. Trump's going to be sending some Haitian immigrants after him pretty soon. <laughs> um, I, there's a lot to laugh about about this, but I do. There's, there are there are two serious elements that I, 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 do, I want to talk about um, because it is fucking, the whole thing is outrageous. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I usually am not one to pick on people for not being swift on their feet on in interviews and on, on TV panels. We've all been there. Sometimes you get put into a tight spot, but I'm making an exception in this case. I want to, I want to play for you an exchange between Ana Navarro and Scott Jennings, two former colleagues of mine on CNN yesterday. When he said that he wasn't being uh, sarcastic, he wasn't being hyperbolic. He was amplifying a conspiracy theory that I think you would agree puts a target on the back of Haitian immigrants and that it is based on racism. Would you agree on that? Anti-black racism would be more pointed. Do you think that if do you think that if there were twenty thousand Scandinavians that had been sent to Springfield, they you, people would be saying I, that they're eating cats look, and not, dogs not, and geese? I'm not going to answer for Why him not? for his memes or anything else. But I am no, going no. To, but I'm asking you: Do you think that no, conspiracy no, I, I, because, is based on racism? Because I, I mean, it's an easy because I, because, yes I, because, no? I'm not, because I'm not going to answer. I don't that, know. That was, I don't that was know. A, that was a right. long here, pause, Scott. I mean, are, because I, I, because I don't know the answer, and I'm not going to sit here and answer for somebody. Yeah, I don't I, talk to Donald no, no, Trump no, about, about what the motivations the, what are, the and I don't and I don't answer to you either. But Scott, but what the, is the answer for you? But the but the bottom line is trying to give you a thoughtful answer. But the bottom. Boy. Yeah, that was a long pause there. Our podcast listeners thought that that was the Sopranos episode. I just went to black there for a second. So like, what, <laughs> where where'd Scott go? Uh, I mean, I you know, not to pick on, I you know, I I don't we don't look the audio speaks for itself with Scott, but like that is the thing. Like Anna does hit on the point. Like it, this is not just like a crazy QAnon conspiracy. Like JFK Jr. is alive. It is a racist conspiracy that targets a specific group of people because they're black, and that's just it. Hundred percent, and and again, you think about the Republican Party, and and you know, and how, what, how, what a one eighty this is from John McCain and George W. Bush. I mean, the reason that I crossed the bridge to join George W. Bush was because of compassionate conservatism and his embrace of immigrants and our neighbors to the south. And, and you remember John McCain famously yeah. in his debate saying, "No, Obama is not an other; he is one of us, and did to do anything other is." you know, un-American. And, and it's just, it's the worst, worst kind of uh, appeal to nativist racism that you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and, and the darkest part of this, this one's going to be tough. This is tough for me. I, I, I almost cried. I, I'm, I'm on a little bit of sleep this one. I've only had three hours, I think the last two nights between the debate and I came down to DC and a little concert last night. I probably shouldn't have done that. I probably should have got a good night's sleep. But you know, <laughs> life is for the living, right? We'll sleep when we're dead, as Tim Wall said. But so maybe I'm just a little vulnerable. But here we go. Um, so this all the thing that started all the stupid cat conspiracy for, for people who have not been following this closely is in this town of Springfield, there have been there has been an influx of Haitian immigrants it's not clear to me actually like some of them are immigrants some of them are haitian americans um that are some of them are like migrants who are not yet citizens and some are citizens and um and there's one incident where there's a bus driver that was uh, that was haitian that was unlike didn't have a license to drive the bus shouldn't have been driving the bus and there's a car accident and he killed uh and a kid died in the car accident aiden clark 11 year old kid and that is like what was the impetus for all of this in like the crazy right wing fever swamps, right? And and you know this this it goes from, you know whatever we shouldn't be having these migrants in. This kid died to you know and then you know it gets expanded, and expanded, and expanded to eventually you have the point where the presidential candidate is talking about how Haitians eat dogs on on international debate. Um, but the father of the kid, Aiden Clark, uh, Aiden Clark's dad, uh, said this to the newspaper yesterday. I now wish that my son Aiden was killed by a sixty year old white man. I bet you never thought anyone would say something so blunt, but if that if that guy killed my 11-year-old son, the incessant group of hate-spewing people would leave us alone. The last thing that we need is to have the worst day of our lives violently and constantly shoved in our faces, but even that's not good enough for them. They take it one step further. They make it seem that our wonderful Aiden appreciates your hate and that we should follow their hate. That's that's incredible. I'm tearing up too. <laughs> and I've had Holy a full shit. night's sleep. <laughs> Yeah, Holy I mean, shit. what 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 a presumption of grace on his part, too. I mean, to to 
to in- extend and reflect that 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 idea. Uh, really powerful. Yeah, and that's what it is. I mean, it's just like that's what all of this fundamentally is, right? It's like this. They are. They're, Springfield is an actual community where this is happening. I saw another interview with like a manufacturing job, a manager of a manufacturing plant, and he's like. I don't know, man, the Haitian immigrants are showing up to work on time. They're like doing, they're doing their job. They're not complaining to me. You know what I mean? Like, and so you, and so you have, and I'm sure there's also, there are also, you know, when you have a big influx of any group of people, you know, there's going to be challenges and like dealing with, you know, you know, dealing with disruptions, but like, that's what this fundamentally is. It's like this American story of like people in a community trying to navigate this and it's being perverted into this like, just yeah. totally blatant racist. Bullshit. And it's so un-American. I mean, Steve yeah. Ratner did a great thing this morning on Morning Joe and just showing the data on, you know, what what's the real story with immigrants and crime statistics. And yeah. as it turns out, oh, they're, it's way under the actual population right. and they're much more law abiding. And it's just, you know, it, it, it to, to take advantage of that for political gain. It's, it's just it's so contrary to the ideals of this country. Um, okay. Speaking about the ideals of this country, you did it. You're a TV man. You know how to transition for me. You don't even know it's coming. Uh, I got Chip Roy for you on the House floor yesterday. Let's take a listen to this. What the hell are we trying to defend? What is left of the United States to defend? What? A school where I can't send my child to pray to God without spending $20,000 a year on top of the taxes I pay? A school that my friend <laughs> sends her sixth grader to with a trans music teacher asking her kid to do some dance in class. Yes, true story. True story. What the hell is left to defend about America? A kid was asked to dance in a class? What have we come to? (laughs) There is a queer arts teacher? I mean, this is just happening now. There's never in history before been LGBT drama club teachers. I would have been been more surprised if it was a straight arts teacher asking him to do the Pledge of Allegiance. (laughs) I mean... What like this is like I, I just don't even know how we how you get to a place like this where you're like what the hell is left to defend about this country? I mean this is where this total inversion in this race, which is kind of what I actually want to talk to you about. Does the clip is embarrassing? It's fun to make fun of Chip Roy, but like this inversion where the Republicans are now the ones that are like this country fucking sucks. This country yeah, yeah, sucks. Yeah. There's nothing to defend about it. We're no better than any other country. We're killers too, and it's the now, well, the Democrat, it's Kamala Harris. It's like, no, 100%, actually. And, and that great. she is and that she has stolen back the freedom agenda is so brilliant. And, you know, George Bush used to say, you know, people don't follow a leader who says the future is all fucked up. Follow me. You know, and Reagan knew that Bush's knew that. Uh, and, and just to have this dystopian, you know, we're a horrible place and it's all fucked up. And you know, this, this dystopian vision of America, uh, you know, that's one of the great things about Harris is that she is, she, I think she understands that. And she has made it all about, you know, a, a bright future looking forward and not a backward dystopian hellscape that people like Chip Roy are trying to paint. Yeah. And the other thing is that she has done is she's not gone down that also that path that sometimes people in love do. And look, there's reasons to criticize America. I'm not saying that America should never be criticized, but of, you know, just focusing overwhelmingly on the um you know the the historical discrimination in the country right like like it's something that that as a woman as a black woman as an immigrant i mean like there's plenty of material to work with she could have talked about historical discrimination in her convention speech or the debate or whatever and it's just she doesn't like it's the opposite uh, well yeah i mean does she ever talk about the discrimination that she's faced never never I've never heard her talk about that. Yeah, and when she went last in the debate, um, another moment that really struck me was when the moderator asked Trump about his turn, her, his turn black comment. And she responds by kind of going through his history of racism. And like the next sentence, right after she kind of lists off Central Park Five and, 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 and you know, birtherism, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you could imagine then going from there to being offended, Right, like to act to talk about how offensive that is, uh, personally, and and sure shit, Donald Trump and Republicans talk about their imaginary grievances and offenses all the time, but uh, but she didn't. She goes to talk about how 
that's not what America wants, right? America yeah. doesn't want to be divided. It's you know, like she goes, "You've done racist stuff, and you're dividing us, and the pe- and people don't want it. People don't deserve it." I thought I very deft of a way to handle that. Yeah, and I think that really resonated with people, and and I think will continue to do. And again, I just think that she's. It's just an example of somebody who has gotten really good at her craft, has learned over time. And, you know, just we've seen a lot of candidates over time. And it's just, you know, you think about, again, sort of the, the, the pressure pit that she's been put in. She's in a microwave turned up to 11 and she's handling it really well. What's left to defend in this country, Mark? Everything's gone to shit. Our you know, teachers tra- asking us to dance. My God, <laughs> transgender the teachers, transgender teachers are out there. You know, there's just might as well just throw this whole fucking experiment to shit. You know, Thomas Jefferson's rolling over in his grave. Um, all right, man. Before I lose you, anything? What? What next? Fifty, fifty plus days. What's your sense of the state of play? Sometimes you have you you occasionally have a little contrarian POV on uh, on you know kind of the the handicapping. So where, where, where's your head at? Well, uh, you know, I, I I just go to this. You know, I I kind of look for data points that aren't the usual data points, and and I just have this notion that you know one thing we do in politics is we look at it through a mirror instead of a periscope, and we're and and you you know first of all. How many people do you know that actually get, you know, pick up a phone to answer a telephone poll? Almost nobody. So, you know, you know, who is it that they're actually talking to? So you got to have some level of cynicism about anything you read about the data and polling. And, and we've seen the problems in recent years. Um, but but I think the smart thing is that, that the Harris campaign is running like they're 10 points behind, running like they're an underdog, uh, which is the only way to run. You run, uh, you know, uh, you run scared or unopposed. And uh, they, they know the historical uh, time set on popular vote and the electoral college and the challenges all there. And so but I think that I'm worried about I, I worry about despite all the energy and excitement about everything, I, I think there's a huge challenge, particularly in Pennsylvania. I was a Josh Shapiro guy and I just thought, you know, it's very it's a very political thing for me. It's like you win Pennsylvania, you win. Yeah. That guy may give you a point one bump, but that, that could be it. Take it. And so. But I am encouraged by, again, the anecdotal stuff I hear that I think that in places like North Carolina, where they have a horrible Republican re- nominee for governor, mm. uh, who's not exciting any Republican voters. And I, I'm hearing, well, sort of, again, except for the, you know, except for the guys in the back of the dirty, dirty video shop eating pizza, eating their dominoes. While yeah. And then the, the people holes. concerned about the trans uh, dancing going on <laughs> at their school. Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's exciting a couple folks. All right. Yeah. A couple uh, folks are getting excited. So, but, but I'm encouraged I, I, if I had to handicap it now, I, I think that Harris is going to win. And I think it's because of new unregistered voters that have come out of the scene. You know, again, sort of anecdotally, you just think about, this has got the feeling of a movement thing, something exciting, something historic. And if you're a young person or sort of a low information voter, you just kind of see it going on around you and say, wow, something's happened. I kind of want to be part of this. You know, there's just that factor going on. And I think that's where she could make a play and pick up North Carolina and or Arizona and Georgia, uh, which would make up for losing Pennsylvania. Harris wins. So you you got you you feel like Harris could win. There's your con- contrary view. You think Harris could lose Pennsylvania and still win. Yes, I do. I think she's going to win North Carolina and or Georgia and, and, and Arizona. There you go. Mark McKinnon. You Thank heard it you. Here. Thank you for pinch hitting today. They can cancel the circus, but there's no race in us. Um, I need to give a special <laughs> thanks to uh, Bulwark Superfans, Russ and Audrey, for taking care of me last night. A little serendipitous bonus night in D.C. Everything's good. We got power. I just got a text while we were live. We got power. Some, you know, some of the plants may be a little worse from the wear at our house in New Orleans, but everybody's safe and sound. I appreciate y'all's concern. I'll be back tomorrow for a weekend edition of the Bulwark Podcast. See y'all then. Peace. <laughs>